Hello everyone, today we talk about the Visigothic Army Organization or Warfare broadly meant. Technically, I've made this series of videos now for the Anglo-Saxons, the Merovingians, even the Carolingians, and we'll expand naturally on all of these. On the Longer Birds, today we talk about the Visigoths, uh, we talked about the Ostrogoths in... but I didn't think about their military organization specifically, but some um, troop typology, let's say. But as far as tactics specifically is concerned, we will make other videos that more or less deal with uh, Germanic warfare this time uh, during the Migration Era in the Romano-Germanic Kingdoms and um, naturally certain deepening into the, the various um, context. For, for example, today we will not address uh, what is actually an important aspect of Visigothic warfare. We will talk about it generally, but there is more to, to dig in it, and we will make an entire video on it. That is their equestrian culture, as for actually other um, Germanic peoples, and a bit the debate that arises from, you know, how much cavalry, you know, did they have? They didn't have all the problem of, you know, these uh, peoples that we call sometimes even Reiter Völker, but we have some troubles, but as far as the Germans specifically are concerned, to, to understand what the, the ratios were. Um, this is an important topic for, for a number of reasons Now I, I don't digress on, but um, it is also important to understand the politics and society of this specific world that today we will, we will discuss, because it's not much about the Visigothic army organization per se. Right, we we know very few information, like us for for all the Romano-Germanic kingdoms. After all, it's mostly understanding what we were not told explicitly by looking at what that reality was. We already discussed the Visigoths in in separated videos, also about relatively to their settlement. We made a, a video especially about Visigothic Aquitaine. But also a general video about the Visigoths and their their history from you know the Thuringian migration to the to to essentially the Arab conquest of Spain. So today discussing the Visigothic army per se, we have to start from the most important realization that among all the Romano-Germanic kingdoms, the Visigoths were the most Romanized of all. So much, in fact, that we can't talk about Visigothic um, Spain or, or Aquitaine. And, you know, you know that, that there was uh, an initial centering in 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 Aquitaine with Toulouse. Then, eventually, the, the, because of Frankish pressure, the the Barren Peninsula was properly settled uh, entirely, and that's where the Visigothic Kingdom also is properly built. Because Aquitaine was also relatively less stable as a reality uh, under Visigothic rule. The, the kingdom is formed, as we will see now, essentially by the, during the 6th century, right, with its institution and mostly at the hands of Luvigil's Gothic armies, right, that um, expanded the, uh, the power of, uh, of, of, of what became properly a monarchy. This is another issue we'll have to discuss at some point. I mean, what is a monarchy in this time? So there, there is an evolution. Today, we technically start from Adrianople, right, uh, as a broader time span. So there is an important change, because definitely the gods at the time of Adrianople were not the ones that, even at the time of Alaric, actually. And Alaric is the exception here in the old Germanic world, because it's it's a true king that is appointed as such by the Romans in a in a Romanized context and that is something very new for the Germanic world and it will become essentially a model for all the Germanic elites that wanted to increase their power over the rest of the people, something that in the Barbaricum had been fundamentally impossible with, uh, for them. With the sedentarization this becomes naturally increasingly feasible and Alaric and the gods in general eventually also with Theodoric for the so-called... Now, we, we simply address them as Visigoths and Ostrogoths, right? We don't address all the ethnonymic problems because they didn't call themselves like this. But the, um, the, the point here is that we are talking of, of an army proper. 
right? You know that the, the, the this Germanic confederacies configured themselves essentially as people in, people in arms, right? Um, there was naturally all the could say civilian population. I mean, all the non-fighting population alongside, and then essentially a f- some tens of thousands of warriors. Which, um, considering the times, uh, of course, it was not a few, but it was the size of basically th- the largest field army could find. I mean, there were several entities like that roaming around. The Romans had their own armies uh, at the provincial level, and so on. These populations substitute themselves often to, 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 to the Roman ones at a local level as federati, and this entails a series of modifications that are not entirely limpid because the documentation is what it is, but that highlights uh, a great continuity also with the Roman uh, military structures. We have, we have made a video recently about exactly about that, right, from from the Roman to the Germanic military organization, something like that. Um, and uh, the, the Visigoths, uh, we can't go as far as saying that, especially the people that, since Alaric mostly, as a specific unitary reality, which the, the, the Visigoths at Adrianople were not as such. There were also other peoples within them. It was normal, actually, at the time. They had the Strogotic cavalry, for example. It was very important in the battle. Um, But um, we could go as as far as saying that Alaric's Visigoths seem to have originally been a Roman field army. And this is literally it. I mean, the the, the people that eventually ravaged Greece, Italy, uh, eventually, after the death of the king, went in settling into into Aquitaine, all, in all this situation was heavily, to say the least, mediated by Roman interference, because of course these were now integrated into the Roman Empire, but at the same time as you understand they also believed as autonomous peoples. It, it all depends, there is a, a very subtle political uh, distinction between uh, these two things, sometimes it's not even you know, proper to make, but it's there, the, the the double face of the same metal in many ways, uh, and, but properly the military organization of the Visigoths as a people, that is to say what we call eventually the Visigoths specifically, they were a Roman army, and I'm not kidding, I mean, these peoples were given specifically, Alaric famously enough, became um, Ma- magister militum, right, um, and uh, of Illyricum, and therefore they were essentially the army of of a Roman province, and were organized as such, and levied, and um, equipped uh, as such, right. What does this mean? It means that the, the original people naturally were these barbarians, which uh, were very habituated, uh, and, and especially in the case of the of what we call the Visigoths, that to to be importantly Romanized, right? They had settled fundamentally in Dacia, and from there also fought with Rome. So this had contributed to the hybrid of of their military culture with the Romans, even before they were fundamentally even settled, or even raised at court in Constantinople, and so on. But specifically, they were now. Uh, re- relied on right by the Romans that used them by the, by the way extensively in all their frontiers after Adrianople this is the interesting thing I think the, the Visigoths paid an enormous amount of, bl- of blood uh, for Rome they fought all, all over the frontiers that we know after Adrianople they were fundamentally the only um, cause uh, ever registered basically in a Roman army of, of a problem of integration in the sense that they were so numerous sometimes uh, but never surpassing like one third of the total uh, Roman army uh, in, in certain cases that were difficult to, to keep at bay for the rest as we know the Roman army has always uh, integrated and catalyzed and Romanized the, 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 these peoples um, which for which the Roman army never as such, got Germanized by the slightest, right? As long as there is a Roman army, that's exclusively a Roman army by definition, a Roman state, right? The Federati are another thing. They are another people doing something on their own. Um, these had been properly being also recorded. Uh, then the Visigoths behave, start behaving uh, like a people on their own. And here we could digress further 
because mm, naturally we have to distinguish, I, I don't want to confuse you too much, between those Visigoths that were properly recruited into the Roman army, which is the, the ones we're talking about, uh, and the ones that were like uh, uh, an ethnic bloc uh, sedentarized along the Danube that are the ones that remain or that form themselves as Visigoths. And here even the concept of kingship is quite important because without that, uh, we're not even sure they would have necessarily... First of all, they would have probably not made it as a individual people. The, the Visigoths were uh, beaten uh, repeatedly by Stilicho, who could have um, had cornered them. Like they could be uh, wiped out without even fighting uh, after those those defeats, but they they weren't for political reasons that Stilicho would wanted to to use by themselves. You know how the history went so much that even the same sack of Rome is mostly following um, not even a revenge because technically in in Italy the the, the local emperor had exterminated Gothic women and children, right? And what the what Alaric, that is a very as a hell of an intelligent leader and capable leader, does is to they, they basically make this very orderly sack of Rome just for getting the money that they were promised to them as as soldiers of Rome. Um, we know also archaeologically, historically, that the, the 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 destructions that Rome suffered were were almost insignificant. I mean, they mostly were you know they had to hand the, the goods and you know the the, the precious, uh, and, but. It, it was a very orderly business, um, so much that the gods are settled by the Romans in Aquitaine afterwards. And this is, naturally, as we were saying before, it all depends from which side you see the, the, the thing. But, and, we, and unfortunately, we don't have much of the opinions, sometimes not even of the Romans, openly stated. So um, it, it's a time in history that uh, we we read through sources that are not really... Uh, so insightful as far as the, you know, uh, the 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 historical reality of the situation uh, could be seen from different perspectives. These were mostly scholars of court that wrote for very specific political reasons that were saying specific things, even from an ideological point of view, even in terms of worldview. For example, uh, the sack of Rome was a tragedy. It was perceived by the greatest authors of the time. Um, as as a tragedy, as as something um, obscure, as as an omen, a bad omen fundamentally. But as far as what the other people believe, this like you know the regular you know colonists living in the Great Blood, you know, do we presume that it mattered more than much? I mean, probably mattered as long as the gods crossed the place and ravaged and uh, and raped your 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 wife or uh, killed killed you, but uh, uh, destroyed everything you had. But the, uh, the the broader thing is that the Roman armies did the very same thing. Right? In fact, the, the, the interesting thing about this Roman, even Romano-Germanic kingdoms, we will see it later, that as in throughout all the early Middle Ages and actually beyond, we could say even up to, to this day, is that you know, sovereigns were very concerned about their own armies not ravaging their own territory. Right? Which happened on a regular base and all these uh, pretty homogeneous dispositions uh, that are pretty universal at that point uh, prove by themselves. So we're not talking about worlds that really gave a damn about whoever you were, uh, about your own people, about other people. The, the logics of politics and power have always been the same and have always been actually very, very sound literally from a, from a pragmatic, rational point of view. There is no proper evil intended in I mean, the higher you rise in power, the, the more intelligence you find. So this was probably, you know, the, the utter violence and uh, horrifying reality that, that in which did these people lived. It, it's something that, as we know, we, we cannot even imagine, unfortunately, anymore. I mean, we don't have the, the emotional or intellectual tools anymore to cope with the idea that this could be a real thing in our world. Um, not even when we find things like genocide, or because th this this was something different, literally at, at the roots of, of of their own cultures, right? It was normal. I don't know. If you had a slave, you could kill it, right? Uh, if someone was defeated, you could. They they lost their 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 importance in front of of, of the universal values. So. Uh, 
This is the mindset in which we have to enter, not to make dichotomies like, oh, it was the Romans versus the Germans and all this this garbage, right? It's it, it's something enormously more complex and complicated for anybody who has even read uh, one source of the time. But aside fr from this, um, the 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 as we were saying, the, the gods eventually settled down, so they create this kingdom problem in the late. Uh, the sixth in the, in the seventh century uh, created true conquest, right? For reasons that we'll see better in a while, that have mainly to do with the same nature of the the, the, the territories that they were settled in, because Spain uh, is is big. We were talking about it um, the other day. We were talking about the Reconquista. There are interesting patterns that represent that uh, represent themselves historically speaking. Um, in this in this medieval uh, Spanish medieval reality, that uh, fundamentally see a settlement in the in the center in the heartland of the Iberian Plateau, for which um, that that has a, a sound strategic and properly, in fact, most significance in this regard. I mean, um, this was true since Roman times. Uh, the Iberian interland has always been a tough um, terrain. Uh, you know, ask the Romans, ask Napoleon, ask anybody who has fought in there, the Spanish Civil War, etc. Um, and uh, the the main problem has been to ever control it all, because the Iberian Peninsula is very diverse within itself in terms of of of, of people, of of landscapes, of 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 climates, right? So it, it's something that you don't simply uh, take as a wall, right? It's not like gold that is all open plains with with those city centers that control the countryside. The Visigoths never make it to fully control the Iberian Peninsula. There were also other ethnic realities, you know, the uh, famously enough, the, the, the land had been settled by the Vandals in the south, the Swabians had migrated, there were uh, other populations actually uh, that either were exterminated or eventually blended with the Visigoths themselves. Uh, we're talking about, for example, a, ch a whole chunk of the Vandals was exterminated at that point. Um, and naturally, as and this is probably the most important thing, the heavily Romanized uh, population of Spain, right, that uh, deeply informed the Visigothic reality. Um, for many reasons, the Visigoths, first of all, weren't many, right, uh, and they 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 said being by the way, said the, the first Germans that settled into Roman territory. They also shared for a longer time the the trend of the empire, right? If we talk about the Ostrogothic or the Longobard migrations, you have consistent number of people, right? Really many, like one hundred thousand, right, or more uh, per each. And these are less, right? Or at least they uh, they they and especially they gets uh, they gets dispersed in some ways. Uh, some remain settled in Aquitaine, but there is an important Visigothic legacy. Some settled in Spain, but Spain is, as we we have seen, one of especially in the south, one of the most radically and, and irreversibly Romanized uh, regions in Europe. And um, this is important because I don't know in northern Gaul or in Britain, Roman rule collapsed. I mean, melted away more quickly, right? In other regions it wasn't like that. And that's why the Visigothic Kingdom is one of the single most Romanized, um, in fact, Romano-Germanic Kingdom, together with the Burgundians, right? Uh, probably not, not even the Ostrogoths were so Romanized as the, uh, the Visigoths had been, and anyhow also Italy gets mm, completely messed up eventually by the Gothic War uh, that is just uh, the Byzantine reconquest and with the Longobards everything really changes so what we have here the Burgundians do not have a great deal of development because they they were weaker I mean the Romans had basically destroyed them under Etsus and resettled in this important area of the, the southeastern and southeastern Gaul in the Alps etc but they, they were not dramatically uh, powerful and this was felt. So basically, the Visigothic Kingdom is the only one is the is the most is the example of the most Romanized Romano-Germanic Kingdom. Also, in interest of time, like up to the the Arab conquest, and it's very interesting to observe it in this way. We will study it also.
um, from from a from a juridical point of view, because here, in fact, the single most Romanized Germanic laws were issued. The, it was basically the Theodosian Codex uh, transposed for both the Germans and the Romans. And we'll talk about this. But as you understand, also the um, the local organization followed certain patterns that had been the one of Rome. Um, Eventually, however, this is exactly what messes up the situation, because not very differently from Gaul, there are many, many analogies between Spain and Gaul, as we often um, observed. Uh, these two provinces had not been uh, dramatically uh, destructured from Roman times. Right. Britain was, uh, Italy, as we've seen, was. Gaul and Spain have an important continuity with the late Roman structures that continues. Um, so, this means, in practice, that the latifundi are there remain intact, and, and that local aristocracy, that is this hispano visigothic if you want to call it in this way, um, aristocracy, uh, it, that is literally the same, you know, Roman, uh, Romano-Hispanic senators that existed before, um, or all Catholic, there is also the problem of the the Aryan religion, but that's another thing, as we will say, uh, as we will see. Uh, remain powerful nobles that eventually mix with the Visigothic aristocracy and create this, in fact, uh, nobiliar class that creates a lot of problems to the monarchy. That, in fact, is troubled with repeated by repeated usurpation and civil war, basically till the end of its days. There are certain times of, you know, greater stability, but essentially the, 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 the reasons that triggered this, uh, this dynamic do not end, right? The Visigoths actually um, were, were developing something in parallel to the monarchy. It was uh, truly the identity of the kingdom at the end of the day. So it's paradoxic that by the end of the Visigothic times, uh, for example, there was a capital that is Toledo, uh, and uh, in, in there, the, the king ruled from, but basically its power didn't go out much of, you know, a few tens of miles around the city. All the rest was governed by the nobility, and that was embodied in turn by the ecclesiastic councils of Toledo, that were a very important institutions, one of the single most important of the early, in early medieval Europe, that rivaled in part with, uh, with papal Rome, and even with Constantinople in terms of actual you know, um, spiritual uh, charisma, if you want, that basically had contained the monarchic monarchic rule that now basically depended on on this aristocratic power. That altogether were trying, however, in spite of the differences, to reinforce a sort of system of cooptation to readdress these large clientele into a, a functional sense to fight against the rebellious areas, notably the Ebro Valley, but especially. Uh, the Basques uh, in the north, in this broad fringes that had also historically not even been a big deal of Romanized, but was essentially Celtic in nature, um, and the and this is very similar to Merovingian Gaul that in fact collapses, you know, by the seventh century. There is not a Merovingian kingdom anymore. There are four smaller ones um, because nobody had, you know, uh, the broader economy in Europe, in Eurasia, etc., had contracted. Demographic resources as well, um, so as a as a consequence, it was more difficult to to uh, say centralize because resources were short, and it's local rulers that increase in importance. And it's exactly these aristocrats that are both lay and ecclesiastical. So much that we will see that the clergy will be uh, basically required to serve because they they were lords, and this is typical, just like in Gaul. Right, you don't find in the rest of Europe much of the same thing, and specifically these two regions. Uh, but this is very important also from a military point of view because these great estates also equate to a sort of proto uh, feudalism in a way. There's so much that there is the problem of you know of cavalry, right? That probably in this sense, in Visigothic Spain, kept developing in a sense, of this equestrian culture that surely the Visigoths coming from Central and Eastern Europe had, uh, uh, mostly Central actually, for, for what we call the Visigoths specifically, had received during the migration era, but that properly, you know, 
before settling in, in Western Europe, they, they had had like mostly like an ethnical aptitude because they, they were just groups, clans, right? They didn't have... When they settled down and they sanitarized, so uh, first of all, the, the Visigothic element dilutes in the population. But this population, as we've seen, has a strong nobil, your, you know, hierarchization. So um, this keep producing cavalry. And this is very interesting because still in Carolingian times, it was recognized despite the Carolingians had created at that point a very different model of cavalry was, that didn't exist in any other country of Europe, um, the, the Franks still recognized to the Visigoths and the Longobards uh, this primacy in equestrian skills from the older times. Now, the Longobards properly, in fact, had a very strong uh, cavalry for Germanic standards, uh, and they, they at the moment of the migration into Italy, surely that, that, w that was the case. Um, Probably just the Ostrogoths had something better in perspective, but you know, by the time of the Carolingians, this thing also had been completely diluted, and Italy didn't have, after the Gothic War, this latifundia system for which the word and nobility. So much, in fact, the, the monarch, the, the Longobard monarchy, was the only one that worked on a in a centralized sense with with actual public power, because there was no noble to compete with the monarchy in a way. Um, in Visigothic Spain, the thing was very different, because in there you assist to a privatization of power throughout all these times. Yes, there is a monarchy, yet there, there are these important councils of Toledo, but effectively th this all reflects a, a series of very important, I mean magnates, literally, of you know very important landholders that uh, also correspond to these broader six provinces in which the kingdom is divided, and in which also... The, the previous Roman military organization was administratively based, and this is very important as a continuity, that are powers on their own regard. It, it's a bit like, in fact, as we were saying in, in, the, in the Merovingian uh, kingdom, right? You have Neustria, Austrasia, then Burgundy and Aquitaine that were fundamentally uh, four chunks on their own. Here you have something similar, and uh, there is also the enormous debate on how and uh, you know and why Visigothic Spain was so easily overwhelmed by the Islamic invasion that literally in like in seven years overwhelmed the, the whole peninsula almost all the to to the north, um, and this naturally doesn't speak much for the cohesion of this uh, of the Visigothic um, of the Visigothic kingdom uh, such, which is something that we should study mostly from a political social point of view, there were also religious issues, uh, the monarchy had grown intolerant um, uh, towards certain categories that vote again, eventually in favor of the Arabs uh, so it, there is um, it's very complex because there is also specifically a, a, an important monarchic ideology uh, together naturally with Christian identity that is developed, even in Spain, just like, once again, Merovingian Francia, right? So, uh, th this all is um, a complex set of um, of relations that, however, as far as I understood in the broader picture of of, of, of the Zygotic Spain, as, as, as I presume also the, the collapse of, uh, of it reflects, hadn't created much of a great cohesion. Right, and once again, this repeated usurpations and civil wars are reflecting it very, very easily. Uh, there is also another point that is being rightfully um, exposed, that is uh, the fact that Spain it was more or less concluded in itself, in the sense that um, there, there wasn't any major threat right after the Franks basically uh, conquered Aquitaine. From, from the Visigoths that retained just the stripe of Septimania in, in southwestern Gaul, uh, there was no... Yeah, there were raids uh, across the Pyrenees and so on, but th there wasn't any r realistic threat of invasion, right? From the Merovingian kingdom that had basically split into different pieces. So we're talking about some of, of the toughest times in, in the early Middle Ages, terms of um, demographic and economical contraction, the, the, the end of the 6th, the, the 7th century. So there is no synetic energy for these peoples anymore to, to carry out major expansions anymore. So this meant that necessarily that the scale also Visigothic action was reduced and that basically 
they uh, they were fighting against themselves, at least within the boundaries of, of the Iberian Peninsula. That surely, you know, uh, had these other populations, especially in the north, that didn't like Visigothic rule. Um, so there was at least this. Uh, it, it was actually an impending threat because they they, they, they they I don't know peoples like the Basque, etc. Also launched launched their own their own raids into into uh, Visigothic Spain. That in fact. Um, is in, in its centers of, 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 of power and of control, uh, the Visigothic uh, considered that the Visigoths are the only um, a Romano Germanic country uh, uh, kingdom that creates military, uh, that cr- creates, that founds actually new cities proper that are specifically of strategic nature. So controlling these key uh, points uh, in uh, over the Iberian Plateau and mostly towards this northern and also partly western direction from the very center, from the very heart of Toledo, of Toledo uh, which reflects the important military character already of this mm, uh, of the, the monarchic base because technically the richest part of Spain was naturally the south. Uh, the Byzantines had reconquered part of it famously enough during the, the broader Justinian reconquest. We don't even know uh, we don't even know when uh, from a traditional point of view, historiography used to say that the the Romans conquered Visigothic, um, you know, the this, um, yeah the, the the southern part of the Visigothic kingdom uh, after having co- conquered Africa and Italy. Now it seems actually they it could have happened because they found out weirdly enough, for statistically speaking, another source, a new source that says that might have been even might have happened earlier. So. Uh, this wa- this reconquest wasn't. Uh, I mean, it was just the, the coastal stripe of Spain. It was the, what interested the Romans. I mean, just the cities, uh, the most productive ones, certain important city center. I mean, it's it's where I don't know. Even the Carthaginians had conquered the country from because that's also where the, the precious metals are. Where you know the most fertile land is. It's naturally also connected to to the internal sea, um, and so on, um, and where. Roman civilization had deeply, uh, re- ex- you know, expanded from. Um, so there is this southern frontier as well, where doesn't seem that there was any major military escalation um, after the, the the invasion, the reconquest, um, and that, however, the, the Visigoths gradually take away from the from the Byzantines. It's, it's a bit like you know the Longobards did when, with Byzantine Italy. That they're considering the times and spaces are a bit of similar similar dynamics. Um, and finally, before the Arabs arrived, the, the Visigoths had reconquered the world coast. Uh, so that's also another very important chapter today we can't discuss, but uh, even in there, everything was intertwined with the competition with the, of, of the monarchy with the local lords. Um, you know, it was a mess, <laughs> right? If you want to describe Visigothic Spain in many ways, in the political order, in the lo- and, and this means, however, a lot of, a, a lot of warfare as well. And now we'll see how this this followed. Um, so mm, the the Visigoths, as we've seen, also ran out of neighbors to attack on a, a long run. Um, in terms of archaeological documentation, it seems that Visigothic Spain offers m- much less burial depots of weapons than than other rest uh, than other parts of Europe. Uh, probably because the country was, in spite of the Aryan uh, elite that eventually com- converts at the end of the 6th century to Catholicism, were overwhelmingly Catholic and also very Romanized. So, as it often happens, uh, the regions that are more easily, uh, they are more quickly Christianized, they are earlier Christianized, yes, and also that are, generally speaking, also more civil in nature, like all this broader Roman population existed there, didn't didn't use to bury people in arms, right? Um, so unfortunately, we don't get much information from that. Uh, but this doesn't mean, however, that Spanish society was less warlike than the others, or that male identity was uh, less bound up with fighting than elsewhere. I mean, in my opinion, it could even be so, but uh, still considering that it has to do with the power of the elites on on the rest of the populace that naturally in the process began became poorer uh, a bit like in Gaul exactly it's always the same parallelism in here so that 
the, the, the masses are disarmed earlier. Um, and this, in a way, yes, does present the problem of it. And there are interesting dynamics, so as such, for example, not just the commitment of the clergy to war, but also of the slaves, right? Which also speaks for the fact that there were lots of people that could provide those, that were land o rich landowners could provide those slaves. And as far as the universal levy of um, Visigothic free uh, freemen were less documented, and there is a debate that now we will look at. Um, we don't even clearly know how the Visigoths um, settled uh, across the, the wall area, right? The, the, the times and spaces are relatively uncertain. Um, but we identify mostly the central, uh, slightly northern area of, of the Iberian Plateau. Um, and uh, legislation and similar governmental material from Visigothic Spain, Ostrogothic Italy, and Burgundian and Southeastern Gaul suggest that, however, each barbarian, as was intended properly in the Roman sources, um, as a soldier, was paid being allotted a share of particular estate. Right. So, just like th this was the hospitalitas, right? It uh, it was giving a, fr a fraction of, of the local land to the newcomers, to the Federati. It was like one-third in Ostrogothic Italy, two-thirds in Visigothic Southern Gaul in Spain, right? Um, which is just fascinating because, for example, you see in, uh, in Ostrogothic Italy, there was more reverence towards the Romans for obvious reasons in that situation we, we discussed just recently. Two-thirds in, 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 in Gaul in Spain means that the, probably the Visigoths had a, a greater grip uh, on Spain that unlike Gaul and Italy at the time didn't have such a you know dramatic um, let's say s s hadn't developed such a, an important se sense a unitary sense of itself right in a uh, Gaul especially had very powerful senatorial elites that also in fact in Aquitaine uh, had this important dialogue we made a video as we were saying before on this with the Visigothic elites and, and so Spain instead especially after the Vandal crossing had probably lost that was a bit of a mess there so the Visigoths arrived a bit more with iron fist as we, we we can understand but mostly as the entitled rulers not necessarily because they mistreated the population um, the, the usually these settlements were were pacific and in fact this this fraction of the land was not literally like I don't know the the Visigoths marched into Spain and said, "Okay, now we'll take away two thirds of the land from everybody who has them." Usually, uh, this land was already deputed in Roman territory to the army, and we're not talking about uh, sometimes not even about actual land, uh, but uh, the unknown. I mean, the, the money, either the money or the uh, natural resources that were destined to the army. Actually, as we will see in in case of the, the Visigoths and the Burgundians, the, the connection with the land was quite important, but this was also evolving um, over time, right, Consider that here there is a, a monetary contraction and we're talking specifically also in a t of a time where the, the these peoples had already settled and therefore they already had the land, so the problem was not giving them the, the means, but re calling them for war which, as you know, was a dramatic problem, the one of mobilization that uh, you know, was not easy to do in a, in a Romano-Germanic reality that is not a, a modern uh, centralized state. Um, so, uh, there is also to, um, to say uh, that um, some Romans at least continued to serve in Visigothic armies. This is another chapter that at some point we'll have to discuss in detail. I mean, the, li the literal survival of Roman military units, not... Uh, you know, other federati. I mean, there were, of course, but, you know, specific Roman units from, from, from the local populace that uh, were to now recruited by the, the Lodis Germanic kings and, and maintain also their, their, their military traditions, their, their spirit, their corp, their identity, and eventually, you know, over time the way that went lost together with, you know, the, the extension also of this Germanic identity to, to all the subjects. But um, it, um, you know, it's important because it shows that this is quite even at also in Merovingian gold that you know there was an important deal even of technical logistical capabilities associated to this pre-existing Roman military administration and uh, system that, that the Visigoths in Spain largely inherit. Um, 
uh, for example, so it wasn't actually difficult. It wasn't much of a t trauma between the, uh, you know, with the, with the settlement of these populations as far as the recruitment of the army was concerned. It was very easy, and it was easy especially for, for the same gods that surely that knew how the Roman army worked because, as we have seen, they, they were actually recruited as, as Roman troops, um, as a Roman army, at least. Uh, and, they, and we know that uh, in, uh, in southern areas of Gaul, um, the local nobility were serving in the Visigothic and Burgundian armies, and even in the Visigothic navy, right? Uh, e and even when the Roman Empire were, was actually still in existence, which, which actually doesn't mean much, because, I mean, the western uh, half of the Roman Empire was namely controlling still, I don't know, even the Franks, the Visigoths, and so on. Um, but uh, just, the, for example, as Majorianus campaign from Italy into Spain um, evidences still in the 60s of the 5th century just to say that there was no teleological deterministic reason for which the, the, the Roman Empire the western half had to, to end um, were uh, actually shows that the Visigoths had also lost much of their proper cohesion I mean the Visigoths properly surrendered to, to the Romans and basically they told them look do we'll come back being federal at some point, send us wherever you want. Um, this is what instead the Vandals in Africa refused to do, thanks to Geyseric, that is one of the greatest leaders at the time, and um, made, uh, you know, the, basically defeated the, the, the Marjoranus expedition even in Spain. Eventually they, they blocked this major Eastern Roman exp naval expedition to Africa. So that that is where Italy is properly, has exhausted all, this, all of its. Um, manpower and uh, agricultural resources and also Odoacre decides at certain point that uh, the West doesn't exist anymore as such um, and the um, this is important because it shows that uh, the, the fact that also these this Germanic populations settling these new territories weren't faring particularly well right and um, if the, the Visigothic army was at this point 30,000 men uh, armed men, well, it means that basically in a single battle, if it goes particularly bad, you're wiped out as an entire people. So these were fragile realities. I mean, how do you control 30,000, uh, you know, an area, uh, a region of, of millions of people with 30,000 men? That, if you don't basically immediately uh, start to cooperate with the local elites there is nothing you can do um, uh, also we know of um, Roman aristocrats that were autonomously defending the remnants of the Western Roman Empire right so there is also naturally a conflictual reality where there is the realization that there is still the possibility of stopping these peoples for example or uh, there is simply a disagreement or a competition, right? But there is also a large homogeneity at this point. You know that, essentially, by by I don't know by the fifth century, we talk about a Romano-Germanic army or a Roman army. It's almost the same in terms, for example, of, of a lot of things of equipment of military culture broadly meant. I mean, maybe surely that uh, Constantinople had a a centralized government, had better logistics and training, etc. But if you look at the quality of these troops, they were largely similar. Um, especially considering that at the beginning, at least these peoples had this very strong metus hostilis that they had matured in the in the barbaricum, where they could be wiped out from a moment to another by other peoples. So they had this kind of more warlike character that naturally historically dilutes during the early Middle Ages, and unless some local structures are developed in a in a functional sense, uh, you know doesn't remain, maintain a, a, a military quality, a, a functionality of the system. And these are all broader political and social problems. It's not uh, like uh, these guys are, are just, uh, you know, w better or worse. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, we know naturally that in parts of Spain, also during Visigothic rule, the local Hispano-Roman aristocracy was, was used from from quite a time to raise troops from its estates and was able to maintain political independence or semi independence until the mid sixth century. We have new of the Bucellari that are mentioned by that name in slightly later Visigothic Spanish sources. 
um, as the followers of dukes and counts. So inter as as this in this sense, you know, with the Bucellari were right. You know, the, the Bucella was this kind of bread um, that the, 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 the troops were fed. These were basically uh, retinues of the great landowners that sometimes, even in the Byzantine Empire, were actually recruited alongside with the army's private forces of you know a, a bit of freelance. Um, I can say it's like but like the mercenary companies, but I mean these were people that had their own power in their own area, and the the state didn't go to interfere with them more than much, um, either because they 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 didn't want to fight with them or because they were actually useful to maintain the the the, the control of the frontier autonomously, uh, but they participated to the to the army itself, and and we find this term also in Spain. Right from so from the other uh, the opposite end of the Mediterranean in in, in many ways it's naturally a, a Latin name, uh, but reveals the presence of this important private clientels that become almost distinctive characteristic of of Visig Visigothic Spain. There is also another term that is used which is Sionis, right? Or still in that, and uh, we know also of bodyguards mentioned by Sidonius Apollinaris for the Visigoths um, that were in attendance uh, upon the, uh, the Visigothic King Theodoric. Such royal bodyguards were known in Spain as Gardinj. Right? The Longobards, for example, had the Gazindi and the, the Franks, famously the Antrustiones. They all have different etymologies, but you know, at least this one is obviously the one of the guard. Um, we do not know much about the um, you know whether the bucellari or the, the bodyguards were specifically framed under the, the 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 army of the Visigothic people, because you know that there was the ban, this mass levy of all the I mean theoretically of the all the free uh, the the able-bodied freemen, um, or if these troops were mostly something private. Probably the, the question doesn't even make sense because it was a, a, a hybrid of the two things. Um, it's possible that the Visigothic bodyguards were under an officer called Comes Spatariorum. Mm -hmm. um, we, as we were saying before, in Visigothic Spain we have um, also personal retinues raised from slaves and other lowly inhabitants of one's estates. Consider that, as we were saying before, the Latifundia were still in place, so it doesn't matter who was free or who was not. Right, uh, colonists were free, but de facto living as serfs. Sometimes slaves uh, had even had it even better than freemen under lordly rule, and this is pretty well known topic for whoever studies medieval history. Um, but over time, uh, like in other in other countries, um, the uh, the the fact that this, this is, these are uh, these are Germanic. Kingdoms. I mean, we, we call them Romano-Germanic because they're most evenly, uh, I mean, culturally, largely culturally Roman. I mean, but the political and institutional models, even in here, importantly Romanized, and in Visigothic Spain especially, basically Roman, were namely all Germanic, right? This is the kingdom of the Visigoths, and as a consequence, in this territorialization of power, uh, on the long run, all the subjects become Germans from a juridical point of view, uh, which is what happens universally, right? There is not a single Western European, I mean, wherever, I mean, the Germans settled in, where this didn't happen, right? It was unavoidable, it was a mere demographic problem in a way, and even culturally speaking, th there weren't dramatic frictions. In the case of the... Um, of the Visigoths, and, uh, just like it had happened, for example, for the Vandals of the Ostrogoths, was the problem, and of the Longobards, there was namely, the, and in, in Spain actually was, was one probably one of the places where the thing had greater importance, but we'll see in which terms, uh, where uh, the, the, the elite was Aryan. So there were these clashes that even um, evolved into properly warfare, even within the same family members even with the same royal line um, that started to fight each other. Not much because anybody cared truly about the, the Aryan or the Catholic uh, differences per se, but because essentially Catholicism embodied this broader local power of, of the elites, that, uh, the 
the Romano-Hispanic elites that were obviously from the the advantage side, as we've just said, and the the ruling classes, a, a part, let's say, of the Visigothic aristocracy, instead didn't want to loosen the grip on the initial settlement, for which, in theory, at least all the the non the non Visigoths were serfs, right? They were not freemen like the others, and uh, was not much ideological, but just a problem of power, right? So there is all this. Mm, problem of, you know, transitioning to a new phase, the councils of Toledo helped dramatically, so much in fact that were, as we were saying before, the, the represent, representatives of the, properly of the native uh, reality in many, but not, to, I mean, the Visigoths were absolutely inserted in it, uh, but they, uh, I mean, originally that's, that's also, that this contrast between the council and the monarchy is, is partly also of that, not entirely, but also. Uh, just as in terms of rela- uh, relation of strengths, um, but on the long run, there there is no divide anymore, and uh, so the the Visigoths accept that th- this is their new land that that they that is Catholic that they that has to work as one, and their attempt now is to to try to centralize alongside these patterns, and this is properly when. The, the moment of highest functionality of the Visigothic kingdom it is towards essentially the end uh, of, of the sixth century, uh, and the evidence upon which we study military service in Visigothic Spain is fundamentally two legal documents. One is the law codes issued by the Visigothic kings; the other is the acts of the regular church councils held at Toledo. Also, we have. Uh, one interesting, perhaps rhetorical, surely highly for the time's literary standards, but still important account of an early medieval campaign, which is uh, contained in, in Julian of Toledo's History of King Bamba. Uh, if we study this document, we understand important features of the, at least of the 7th century Visigothic army. And it also shows parallels naturally with Merovingian Francia, uh, Anglo-Saxon England. Uh, compared to Roman times, the provinces of Visigothic Spain continued to be used as military districts with provincial armies that were commanded by a Dux Exercitus Province, right, which means Duke of the Army of the Province. Right, which is not to be distinct, uh, which is not to be confused with the Dux Exercitus, uh, that was instead the commander of provincial levies in wartime, right? So th- there were di- different uh, officers in this regard, uh, whereas the the first one um, was instead the, the permanent one that was theoretically appointed there. Uh, by by the king. This is something you find even I don't know with the with the Frankish uh, with the Frankish comitas or the uh, Longbird uh, Duchess and Gastaldi. Um, so it, it was a normal thing. I mean, it was just you know there were these provinces, the Roman Empire, that corresponded to imp- I mean to historical d- districts of of the land, right? More or less change in Roman times. Um, and that were important base of power uh, on, the bitch, on which the military organization had basically remained anchored since especially the Diocletian's reforms and, and, and so on. Um, in, as in the 6th century, the army itself was divided into apparently decimally organized subunits, uh, the Tufe, that were in fact command commanded, or at least led by the Tufadi, this was the name, were apparently the equivalent of a millenarius. Some actually say that those were split, actually that the um, that, that they might have been two different people, but it's likely to be the case. So the millenarius naturally was the commander of the thousand. Then there were the quingentenari, that were the, uh, the commanders of 500. The centuriones, like the centurion, like at the head of the centene, if hundred men, and the decuriones, at the head of the, uh, the cania of ten. Uh, th- this is pretty standard in Romano-Germanic armies, I mean the decimal uh, repetition. We think naturally it was um, 
I mean, th- th- we mostly get this this numbers from from documents, so we don't know what the military practice really was, and uh, the the problems of levying an army this times are very complicated. Maybe we'll have to make specific videos on. I mean, it's not that they were dramatically complicated at the time; they were mostly difficult to achieve. But um, it's just that we do not know historically much, right? Uh, the commanding officer of an assembled army was called Prepositus Ostis, or Comes, or Dux, um, as we've seen. Uh, depending, especially uh, the the latter being in uh, this local uh, districts. The commander in chief instead was a, usually a nobleman uh, known as the Dux Exercitus Hispaniae, so the commander of the Spanish army. So the army was raised by written summons sent out down the chain of royal officers. So the king said, "Okay, we have to make this campaign against those Basques that are, you know, passing our, you know, uh, and and the, you know, and these guys received the thing and they they start mobilizing and they they met at some somewhere. Naturally, uh, it was very rare to to carry out like a." A national levy of the world Spain. Probably, a, it's possible. Maybe never even ever happened. Um, it was usually the, the 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 it involved the provinces of that were bordering the the enemy areas, or some that were more resourceful than others. Consider, demographic resources are important here. You can't squeeze, uh, you know, this lands more than much. We're talking about early medieval times. There's there's a dramatic material poverty in Europe. Um, so and even more demographic at, at a certain level. So uh, these are all. I mean, you can even raise an army, but then maybe that will disrupt the economy of of an entire province for generations to come. So it, it's quite uh, it's quite meaningful. And you understand, however, conversely, how pressing the the needs, especially of defense of of the cultivations, you know, really were. So um, Spain already in this time has the, that character that will become typical of their conquest, right? This uh, European Far West that also sees a big deal, in fact, of raids, of uh, cavalry warfare as a consequence. Um, I mean, not necessarily, but usually. Uh, even considering, I don't know, think about these were areas that also in the ancient world were famous for their cavalry traditions. Think about the Cantabrians, this, um, especially this light cavalry, this, this tactics of, you know, hit and run, skirmishing, Raiding and so on. Uh, so these are, you know, naturally practices that were proposed, customs that were proposed themselves uh, historically in the same areas. And um, interestingly, in his rule for monks, Isidore of Seville, one of the most uh, prominent intellectual figures in medieval Europe, says that those entering a monastery should be entered into the tables just as military records are, right? So here, the the, the idea of the monastic militia that we were talking about also in previous time, uh, regarding the, the, even the Reconquista and the Spanish military orders, but let's say this is just a coincidence naturally, but the idea was there. And um, and it tells us that habitually in, in, in the Visigothic army there the were these lists of those who had to participate. Which actually is it's also pretty normal. I mean, we, this happened in, also in the other Roman and Germanic countries, especially as far as you know, literacy was spread, especially in the southern European areas. And the uh, this is an intriguing reference, and uh, it's not a classicism. It really mm, shows that the continuity of a military organization alongside the the, or, the earlier pattern. And on the base of this evidence, there is been a lot of debate regarding, you know, the the alleged permanence or, or semi-permanence of, of a Visigothic army. So I think historiography is largely skeptical about it, at least the most updated one, because... Um, we have just um, uh, sort of a, the evidence of a commissariat law, which we see that cities and forts, the castella as they were called, uh, were fundamentally required to stockpile provisions, the unknown, right? So the same uh, name for the Roman administration for the army and the city, and also the, these various forts, uh, 
but it doesn't talk about something like permanent garrisons. Naturally, um, there probably were. I mean, there were people who regularly garrisoned them, either through a rota system or simply there were private, uh, you know, magnates that controlled with their own, uh, with their own guards, their retinues, the, these areas. So, uh, for example, you know, a bodyguard cater would have been permanent. Right, you don't have to recur to the modernistic standards to say that. Of course, also in the early Middle Ages there was a permanent uh, army of some sort, but we're talking ab about a few troops that were regularly in, in in arms because those times every freeman was regularly in arms, and these people were usually the the ones that were the bands of tags that you know controlled the land, uh, exacted the uh, the the. Uh, the tribes, whatever you want to call it, right? So, it's uh, naturally um, a, a very, uh, a very intuitive picture that we we can draw about this. But there is nothing like a, a standing army per se. It's, however, important to see that uh, the, the there is a real continuity with the organizational, the, the previous organizational model, so that uh, a, a Roman military administration had fundamentally kept working in this sense um, and eventually troops would be just raised whenever there was the need. Uh, there is also a concern that we find also in Ostrogothic Italy um, about the, the the fact of you know controlling that your own armies wouldn't uh, commit abuses while crossing their own land which, as we were saying before, is totally normal for the time, um, these armies to sustain themselves along the march, right? They never think historically, as we were saying before, that, you know, since you are from one country, or alleged country, whatever you want to define it, by those times, you know, you don't pillage or rape or, or steal or devastate locally because it's your country. They didn't give a damn. Nobody ever did, historically speaking. There is no evidence of, of the contrary, actually. Uh, if not, it's... Unless it's you know it's literally the, the army of, of the the same place where you were raised right but that that that's another situation. Um, it was uh, in many ways a lawless reality. When you talk about the far west, it's it's literally it. Here it's starting to become in, with the increasing privat increasing privatization of power. Um, also, stockpiling is um, in, implied, for example, by Frankish taxation. I mean, it, it also other countries functioned in the same way. So even in here we we find the same thing. So by uh, the later 7th century it would appear that all landowners and royal slaves were liable for military service. How true is this? You know, Bamba and his successor Erbeg, were two kings of the Visigoths, both issued laws about military service. The one promulgated by Erbeg states that old men, quote, whether general, count, or gardingus, Goth or Roman, because even the, the, the distinction still existed at some level, freeman or manumitted slave, or any fiscal slave, because hmm, consider that the, the, the Visigothic law still contemplated formally the, the, the ethnic division, had to attend the summons, including the clergy too. So think, think about it and think how powerful in that sense also the clergy could be, as we will see now. Uh, because if you read this, it, it may seem that military service, the military obligation, was universal. I mean, obligation maybe in the sense that all the community probably contributed with, with not with, just with the troops, but specifically with the resources, they, they had the agricultural resources. But I mean, military service wasn't universal. We, we don't have uh, evidence of this in the practice, then, of course, theoretically, every freeman had not just the, the duty, but the honor, technically, as, as both in the Roman and in general, uh, excuse me, in the Germanic traditions of serving in the army, because that, that was the prerogative of, of, the, of the free. But we don't have of any evidence, of course, of, of, a, of a universal levy of these troops. It was unconceivable for the structures of those times. It would be a, an unbearable cost, but not even one-tenth it would have been feasible. Uh, so, what actually this uh, document can be interpreted like 
just like for example the service in Ein of Wessex laws is that uh, we, the, the kings were operating down a chain of lordship and clientship. The provision of Arabic's law that all such men bring one in ten of their slaves, for example, makes it clear that we're talking about a stratum of reasonably significant landowners. Right? What, what do you think then? How many people, according to you, in Visigothic Spain owned even just ten slaves all over the population? I mean, the majority of the population were you know, just very modest nuclear families, as as we can imagine, maybe extended, depending on the situation, could vary. But, you know, owning, you know, already 10 slaves is that you're not the typical and overwhelmingly uh, majority, from a numerical point of view, Visigothic farmer. Uh, consider that, as we were saying before, there were communities that were also regularly exposed to raiding. Right, so they also were militarized by themselves. They weren't, and they were useful also as a, you know, as a defense for the same kingdom. But more importantly, in the history of law, never think that what is law is actually what happens. On the contrary, if there is a law, it's because something doesn't work like that before, and probably it will not work either, especially in early medieval times. Uh, what this means, especially in the case of Arabic, that. Um, was facing some some troubles because it was a time of uncertainty in, in royal succession, and therefore he probably just wanted to enforce the king claims on military manpower. The kings were the ones to whom you had technically obeyed in terms of the the, the, the command of the army. How this new Germanic regimes had structured themselves in relation to the people, but most people also would say nuts to that, uh, like, you know, uh, maybe we didn't stress this enough, but uh, that there is this passage from the settlement that was somewhat unregulated, the initial one, um, not completely mediated by the Roman authorities, but not even completely controlled by the same kings, right? These were originally, when settling, uh, from the migration era, um, you know, namely in control of the people, but all the various clans would do whatever the heck they liked, right? And especially in Spain, I presume, you know, the, the, the thing was like properly an invasion from Aquitaine when the Vandals went away, and, or at least they were to be swept out. So it was actually a pretty massive thing. And not just the oligarch, like the, the, the Visigothic aristocrat would say, was the king to, to be a king even when I, I have not a... Uh, I mean, theoretically, they were appointed by the Assembly of Freemen, but the, the political practice took eventually other, other forms. But also, even the average Visigothic farmer said, you know, I, want, I you know, didn't have much horizons of the, in terms of, you know, thinking of, of kingdoms and, you know, yerkes and so on. He, he just wanted a living, wanted to, to find his, his plot of land and working, you know, better than, than what they had done in 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 uh, you know more uh, less developed areas so the the question here is, is very important naturally because even ask this one tent it's not even you know we have seen that these weren't all the people first of all um, it was just reinforcing specific ties with the people who had power because they had more slaves they were landowners and so on but it's just a claim so what does this mean even in terms of issuing properly the the, the, the number of troops to that they had to serve has has not much of a the positive meaning we could intend and the same goes for for any other Romano Germanic kingdom at this point and actually it's possible the Visigoths had a greater grip right surely for example Anglo-Saxon England was all fragmented was not even a, a kingdom specifically uh, the Franks probably were fine with mobilizing this retinues uh, other countries, like, I don't know, the Longbirds, uh, you know, it takes a while, but a few, uh, you know, a few decades before they start creating even a, a system of this kind after the settlement. So, uh, it's it, it all depends on many factors that are very difficult to control. All of these dukes of the provinces also could do whatever the heck they liked sometimes. Everything was nominal, right? And what really uh, kept the things uh, together was the... Uh, whatever gluing political factor uh, the interest these people could have in kind, there was always a way of doing that, right? meaning that, that there was always the pro-royal party and the pro-oligarchic well, uh, party in, in a way, right? That's also exemplified, as we've seen, by 
uh, in part by initially at least by the Aryan and the Catholic party uh, but it's also more complex but let's say that every time there is a political division you're sure that it's never you against all the others like it's there is always some of the other that say okay well the king is in that situation that is namely king whatever but uh, let's exploit that so maybe that if we succeed he will give us something in turn right it's all like this right and multiply this for all the sub clientele I mean it's a mess and that's the mess we're talking about but it's still how the world uh, functioned regularly before uh, before before the nation state before the the state took over as sole source of law and authority and um, so Visigothic law also was in many other fields very much concerned with ties of lordship and patronage which naturally speaks for the presence of the social certification and clientelary system uh, for example uh, legislation repeatedly tried to deal with the violence committed by lords followings those binds of tags right they, we know that pretty much all over Europe there were these lords that did whatever the heck they liked they had their armed men with them uh, they were the local bosses they are the mobsters right that's present everywhere and, and, and the, the, the least the, you know the more primitive society is the more it is it, it's like towards towards that direction right here at least there is an idea of a kingdom of a Roman administration where the cities is something just think it in places like I don't know in in Scandinavia or other that's properly the thing and that's why it was so militarized as a context because they were naturally always clashing against one another I mean read Gregory uh, of Tours about you know the Frankish counts of this time I mean uh, you read certain stories that naturally are, ver are filtered also from that specific perspective but um, you know, it was a constant struggle, an armed struggle. Um, also, Law was concerned about the abuse of patronage to protect clients from the workings of the law, right? Because all these various estates were somewhat mm, enclosed, right? Spain probably even has, in my opinion, an earlier process of encastellation because of the nature of the land. Um, all this tough terrain, the, the the presence of this scattered centers of control over the the, the, the barren plateau, um, and the, the 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 sparse distribution also of the the Visigothic settlement that that is another important thing that is in a very extended area, right? Um, and uh, also it, it it has different shades of Romanization. The most Romanized areas we've seen in the south, the center is half and half, right? Uh, the north, let, let's not even talk about that, there's this other settlements founded by the same kings that are like military colonies. So the militaristic nature of this all is very evident, right? And in a certain sense even procures their conquista, right? It's probably a character of the Iberian Peninsula. And it had always been like that properly, even presumably in pre-Roman times. Uh, furthermore, from a at least the later 6th century, the law had tried to regulate how an aristocrat's bucellari were remunerated. Uh, this is interesting as well because it shows like um, like an interference of royal authority with private business and especially the one that regulated this, this retinues. Um, and this concern also appears to have been stepped up in the later 7th century. Uh, there was also, similarly to Frank and England, uh, um, a concern to define what exactly a lord could expect from his followers. And what of their property was his if they changed pattern, for example. With this in mind, it seems that King Erwig expected all landlords to perform military service and to bring all those who were dependent upon them ideally. Also, the possibly the most interesting aspect of Arabic's military law is the specification that all of those who were summoned to the army bring one-tenth of their slaves, as we've seen. If they failed to, to do so, the crown would take those left behind. <laughs> this is interesting. I mean, if you don't send your trooper for war, I will take all the, uh, all, all the people. 
this is interesting because naturally slaves were like uh, inferiors in this regard so with the, the, there is no evidence for free for freemen of the same but as we've seen also the the social status was somewhat blurry in in many ways and um and it does you know speak of for for a you know pretty radical dialectic in this reality that sounds also a bit roman actually because the romans since diocletian diocletian reforms you know the also the tying of the troops to the land and the military service or the generational thing said you know i mean they were draconian against those who didn't want to serve uh, naturally uh, this reflects in probably in visigothic spain both the need of troops and specifically for the kings but probably also for the broader demographic shortage and secondly, this inherent conflict between royal power and private and aristocratic power. Uh, another interesting aspect is about the slaves' equipment, because they were issued at least some body armor, shield, swords, spears, bows and arrows and slings. So it's like more or less what any other uh, trooper should have brought uh, on on the field. Um, naturally, these were to be provided by their owners, given they were slaves. But it, it's still it, it, it's fascinating because usually, as you know, you don't want to arm a slave, <laughs> really, um, whoever you are. Not if you are the master, which I mean, in, in certain actually in certain circumstances they would, because probably as we've seen, these were properly retinues. They they were used also as bodyguards, as those same thugs we were saying before. But the point here is probably subtler because if you, first of all, take away, it's not just about taking away the slaves from the masters, it's also perhaps the attempt of creating in a, in a world that is dominated by aristocracy uh, something that resembles a new class of troopers that become military autonomous under royal service and that maybe can even have the cohesion and com combatantistic I don't know, be veteran uh, identity to say, okay, we don't want to be slaves anymore, we want to be uh, emancipated from our masters. Which is usually what monarchies do. I mean, monarchies, contrarily to what is commonly believed, do not seek for enslaving people. Right? They, they seek, on the contrary, to free them from the oligarchies, because the oligarchies are the ones that check monarchic power, especially in medieval times. This is true also, I don't know, it was true in the Roman times. Right, uh, the emperor stood with the people and the army that made that composed them. The problem were the senators that didn't want these social classes to emerge and to compete with them. So here it's a bit the same thing. Uh, uh, and in fact, also the use of slaves as soldiers seems uh, to be peculiar of, of Visigothic Spain, specifically, perhaps going back to King Theodis recruiting of a slave army allegedly 2,000 strong back in the day uh, which uh, would I mean the reason of this is probably the the nature of pre-Visigothic Spain compared for example the one of Gaul right because the Franks uh, as we know had I mean entering Gaul they had this massively stratified society probably uh, the most stratified one in Europe uh, but the Germanization of this lens probably also reinjects a bit of this, you know, Freeman class that we find either here and there. Um, and instead, in Visigothic Spain, it's likely that Latifundia perhaps had maintained such such an importance that, and there was no neighboring, you know, barbarian people that could reinject these bands, these war bands that would autonomously counter this 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 uh, social social order that. Uh, literally, there, there was no much of a of a freeman now left to 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 make leverage to to create a consistent army on its own. So, uh, the uh, speaking of slaves, we probably look at the uh, also the ugly face of a very very privatized and uh, aristocratic society that did whatever the heck they like in their own world, and and this definitely reflects. All the problems that the kingdom had, you know, just by uh, in terms of political history, more more evidently.
In fact, there are no references to slave soldiers from anywhere else in post-Roman Europe, but Spain, right? And even more, it seems that the semi-free and the poor free of the army were just like a military aid of these slaves that had the specific military uh, role, right? Uh, usually, uh, as we've seen, that the, there is a broader juridical Germanization of the subjects in Romano-Germanic Europe. And I don't know, when, let's say, the, the, the Longbirds conquered Italy, there were the, uh, the various shades of freedom, right? Uh, slaves were not called for the army. But for example, the Romans, who were half freemen in a way, uh, fundamentally were were called in a way or another to, to the army and nobody thought of using the, the slaves, right? Uh, in this society instead, the slaves are somewhat even more important than the average freeman. This is, this is fascinating and it, it could actually speak for the, uh, the really, the demographic ratio at that point, so much that the Visigoths might have been originally freemen, but there were so few that all the rest of society now had turned not into slavery because of a specific enslavement, but because simply the the the, the oligarchy had taken over in uh, Romano-Hispanic society. So it's 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 very strange, actually. I don't know from a from a broader juridical social point of view how the situation in Spain was in this regard, because I didn't know honestly that. Um, there was I I knew actually that Visigothic Spain was still a bit more dynamic uh, from a socio-economical point of view than other areas so that there were you know there was more freedom broadly meant but it was a, a, an active late Roman society it was fairly open I mean late Roman society for example was more open than the earlier one right uh, also with Christian I mean women for example had a more juridical uh, greater juridical autonomy and so on but perhaps this was true just in the southern um in the southern lands, the ones also partly recovered by the Byzantines, while in the Iberian Plateau it was like the the, the real <laughs> thing that we have described uh, as as the far west, and um, so it's uh, it's a it, it seems like a deep political and social issue here, and in fact it pertains surely to the peculiar Spanish meaning of slavery. Uh, also, how these troops were used in battle is sadly not known, nor uh, you know how they employ their weapons because they 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 might have been just you know a guard. What we didn't say is that the importance of cavalry was quite pronounced. We have evidence of Visigothic armies relying on this important mounted element uh, in in a shock force and this as we've seen rooted the question tradition it was rain big rated thanks to these clientels and the possibility of a very few to have uh, most of the wealth there and therefore serving on horseback and you know being really uh, effective in that regard and in this context usually infantry tends to become kind of subordinated uh, from a political and military point of view and therefore also their role in the battlefield perhaps lower. So this is not to say that these troops were not good, I don't know, infantrymen as, I don't know, spare men or, or archers as we will see. That, that probably remained important as it generally was right in late Roman times both among the Germanic peoples and even among the Romans. But the uh, the point still it the it's the the idea of a uh, increasing uh, relation of servitude that recalls pretty much feudal relations between the 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 lord and 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 the and the serfs, right? So also the the tactical subordination might have been uh, a real thing, right? There is also an interesting paragraph in Ervik's Law that. Um, uh, says that how the king must now turn his attention to how his armies are paid and supplied. Right? On the other hand, a slightly later love of Egica called up slaves who had been freed by royal intervention on pain of their return to servile status. So here is exactly what we were saying before. The kings were making leverage on this large servile population to uh, unhinge, let's say, the uh, the aristocratic power, 
at, at the roots of its military capabilities by making the the, the slaves race, uh, in a sense. Uh, the, there are interesting parallelisms that I could think, uh, for example, from the Gothic War uh, by Totila in Italy, which was pretty much the, the same situation um, at that point in, in which uh, f uh, slaves were promised freedom right, from their landowners had they fought together with the gods, uh, alongside with the gods, against the, 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 the Romans. right? And, and actually that had a great success eventually. I mean, among the, the slaves, among the colonists, let's be honest, because those weren't properly... Well, well, they were actually also slaves, yes. But even in there, the situation was blurry. Um, eventually, things went differently in as, as far as the military situation brought to, to the feet of the gods, but that's another thing. But the, the social change had, had existed. We know um, from mostly from archaeological sources, that something like that happened in Anglo-Saxon, uh, actually, no, in, in, in post-Roman Britain, even before the Anglo-Saxon migration. And that was ugly, because nobody actually freed the slaves, but they freed themselves, right? The, the, the colonists freed themselves, and we know that it was pretty damn ugly. Uh, the entire plots were, were all, uh, borders were all redrawn, right? Whatever happened there was, was brutal. Right, was really brutal. And so this was actually a, a great problem that at the same time reflects for Visigothic Spain the persistency of the Roman model that wasn't dying, right? Just like in gold. So once again, the same pattern represents itself where in other lands like Britain or Italy, things were, were changing and had actually already changed at this point. The Visigothic kings were trying to bypass the aristocratic support for Lemon an army and relying on, on a new class of, of, of troopers. Uh, a similar concern may have lain behind Arabic's call-up of the so-called Servi Fiscales, so literally the fiscal slaves, which is yet another, uh, you know, from the fiscus, right, so it's another uh, evidence of a, a continuity in, in Roman society uh, as the fiscus was the one that regulated naturally taxation and specifically also the, the control of the population in, in their land, how many people were, how much they had to pay accordingly for labor force and so on. These things were all intact. And at this point they were not like that in any other post-Roman reality in Western Europe. Uh, there, except perhaps uh, Aquitaine. Right, north of the Pyrenees, uh, it seems that the the armies had also uh, been based upon aristocratic retinues. Uh, this was a land that had a strong Visigothic legacy, even after the uh, the Franks basically seized uh, the the control of the region. In fact, the land would always remain kind of rebellious to the same Frankish rule on a longer period, and it's not surprising in this sense that. Aquitaine, that is not actually the historical Aquitaine, but the Diocletian province that arrived up to up to the Mediterranean, so including the, the previous Narbonensis. So one of even in there, one of the single most Romanized lands in the Mediterranean. So that pattern went, went along. Consider that the Visigoths also kept fighting in, in southern Gaul at this point were important race, we'll see it in a while. Uh this wall picture speaks uh, for the for the nature of the, the uh, also of the later Visigothic kingdom. M many historians have pointed out how it seemingly entered in a, a spiral, a destructive spiral of civil war, usurpation, er, and repressions. Others have, however, countered uh, this um, this idea, stressing on the contrary that the, there was. Uh, even uh, you know a, a centralized strength. My opinion is a bit of a hybrid of the two. Speaking of centralized strength, is too much. This was all but a centralized system. It was heavily pr privatistic. What was happening is that the you know the Roman infrastructures from one side had both granted the survival of a, of a clientary system. Of privatistic rule, but also maintained the, the, the administration tools to, to centralize in a certain reality. Uh, 
I don't know, even the fact that it was a specific capital um, that the Visigothic kings kept maintaining this, um, you know, this importance after all from an institutional point of view, in spite their their effective power was was decreasing. Um, uh, is uh, speaks of for for a balance in which th that was being resolved, unfortunately not through a centralization which failed because the the aristocracy well, had the upper hand, right? The councils were more powerful than the, the king, but uh, there was a dialogue between these various areas of the peninsula in terms, in fact, of of privatistic rule, and, uh, and therefore uh, a broader link, let's say, between all these important provincial chunks held by by magnates, by, by aristocrats that were trying to, to form a, you know, a broader, an ever broader uh, net of connections that could still function importantly in a, in a, in a monarchic and even a, in a dynastic sense, in a way or in another. I mean, these were becoming important lineages the problem is this uh, that this was all complicated by the presence of um, rebellious lands that were either rebellious because they were more Romanized than, for example, the, the central plateau like uh, the Ebro Valley that was very Roman. You know, we were Aragon fundamentally with the merge from with Catalonia. Uh, the Basques, uh, also this broader area, that would uh, correspond to today's. Um, uh, port, central and northern Portugal and northwestern Spain um, that remained a bit at the fringes of of, of the kingdom that had also probably some Swabian uh, legacy that didn't like uh, the, 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 the monarchy so much. Um, so it was a very unstable system. It didn't, it hadn't, it, it had failed as a state but it still was lively enough to to uh, attempting a further stabilization. Um, so this is it: continuous revolts by powerful magnates. Um, also, this broader problem of dynastic instability, a bit like in Merovingian Francia, for which it wasn't much. The, the reveals the speaks for a great level of privatization. I mean, the idea that after all, the the there was a um, really a, a private succession that now was making the difference rather than the, the formality of the of the institutional of the old Germanic reality where you know it was the people that elected Democrat that never worked. Um, I mean the Council of Toledo technically still reflected that but it was an hypocrisy by saying you know there were just a few that ruled and they were the powerful ones and as we have seen the, instead the social spectrum was you know it was all about in you know the presence of an important backbone of freemen. Uh, in, in the central decades of the 7th century, Kindesbint and his son Rechesbint seem to have maintained a stronghold on the throne, but nevertheless had to deal with repeated rebellions as well, so there were actually phases of stability, right? Uh, also the, um, the, the conversion to Catholicism was an, a very important step, right? Leuvigil, the record right, that, that period there, um, that had caused warfare, but at the same time uh, seized, um, you know, th th this name, namely contrast between an allegedly Aryan uh, and, and a Catholic, uh, uh, let's say, party. That that's an important step towards the the concept of a unitary power. In fact, actually, the Visigoths do develop something like this, right? They, they do develop a. a uh, a mystics of the monarchy, a bit like the Merovingians, uh, and they 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 stress especially the the orthodoxy, the Christian orthodoxy, as the the main gluing factor of Spain. That will be in fact, actually, in the military culture of the Visigothic armies, um, uh, be quite evident and would even remain as as a legacy in the history of the Reconquista and of the remnants of Visigothic power in, in the north after the Islamic invasion. Rechesbin's successor, Vamba, was faced with a rebellion in Septimania. That was this import, very important land, as we've seen before, it was the, the last Visigothic avant-post in Gaul. It was very Romanized, very rich. 
but also very distant. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the, if rich and distant means rebellion, right? Um, but he he th he managed to quell this revolt. Um, yet, um, what is noteworthy is rather the legislation following this war. Um, and equally significant that uh, unlike Kindesbind, Bamba did not feel able or willing to punish his opponents too severely, commuting that sentence to decalbation. Decalbation was a serious thing in, in, German, in the Germanic world because the idea is that the strength of the warrior and of the man laid in hair. Uh, so it was actually, yeah, I mean, it's better than being killed, but up to a certain point because it's as if you had been dishonored. So I don't know whether it was such a... Uh, you know, a great act of pacification after all. Um, and Bamba's own retirement into a monastery may have been involuntary. Uh, also about these things, it was very common to, for these kings to be deposed and also normally, in fact, being closed in monasteries that were like prisons in that regard, political prisons in that regard. And it is difficult to be sure as the episode um, has attracted legendary accretions and these are kind of important figures. I mean, after all, consider that Visigothic Spain is the first Spanish kingdom proper, right? Uh, in the history of these countries, like, uh, like even with Italy, like, you know, th these are countries that are specifically born, we could say, in a unitary sense, uh, traditionally, um, from in a sense of national identity with, with these specific monarchies. Um, and uh, so... Even the the vision of these worlds is is still connected to a lot of contemporary issues in a way. But today we can read through them kind of clearly and and understanding some how shaded this, these realities were. After it follows Arabic's legislation that we've seen before, so everything has to be seen in in context and in this case also in a long term perspective because. It's not that these were systems that changed uh, quickly over time. So, um, also this, the same kingdom lasts uh, a, f a few centuries, right? So, um, the pre-existing realities had been also somewhat more impacting in a way. And um, in early medieval times, polities had a, a, a low control in the territory and so on. So, these were dynamics that should be also studied on the base of specific uh, regional, uh, provincial um, scale, right? And this is a general summary just to introduce the issue. Um, so another obvious aspect is the, uh, that we mentioned before, is the ease through which the Visigothic Kingdom fell at the hands of the Arabs, which, which is very meaningful and speaks for, for, for instability, right? And we can say how deeply had weakened the Specifically, the military institutions, but probably you know, um, it, it it came into a situation of of lack of, of of unity of cohesion, and that made the thing collapse so so easily, right? But um, in in a, an effort that shows perhaps the the impossibility of further improvement is how ideologically uh, the the kingdom was was stressed, right? In its importance, that the fixed capital established in Toledo, the royal uh, regalia developed from the late sixth century, the periodic councils of the Spanish Church that uh, had this broader, uh, almost ecumenic uh, ambition. Uh, the, there was a, a broader you know, pride, sense of identity. I mean, the, fa the fact that surely these aristocracies felt in charge of very important dynamics as they were. Archaeology tells us how um, also the Roman influence, I mean, the, at this time, the Byzantine influence specifically in, in, um, in Visigothic Spain began to, to permeate the, the Gothic culture, uh, the earlier... Uh, local forms, uh, especially during the seventh century, there was an important connection properly before the the Arab invasions, before you know the Mediterranean was cut in two, basically uh, that connected even Spain with Constantinople. The Mediterranean always facilitated uh, 
contacts. It was like a big highway, so it's not the distance that really was the problem, but really the channel through which these inf new influences uh, arrived and were permeated by. Um, the, there is um, uh, also an analysis of funerary customs that doesn't actually speak, as we've seen before, for a dramatically militarized appearance, for example, of, of the regional aristocracy. I don't know about this because I haven't studied properly the the sources that I mentioned are pretty 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 standard, um, but uh, that's another issue to take into consideration. I mean, how unitary this thing really was. I mean, what was also the threat that a specific uh, aristocratic reality from the other part of the peninsula, let's say, could pose? To, to the king, probably high, but I mean, in terms of actual territorial control, I mean, could they extend, could they expand? They, uh, probably they didn't have much of, of that force, right? They they could context the, the power, they could interfere, could uh, act from, from the distance to make political pressure to contain the the, the monarchic rule, and, and that, that makes sense, but uh, on the actual capability of this reality is also to form, um, let's say, a state on their own or a or a broader uh, power on their own, right? Merovingian Francia, in this sense, was perhaps better suited, right? The idea is that Merovingian Francia had a high, even a higher um, level of aristocratization, especially in certain contexts. And but generally speaking, it, it was the place where there were the richest aristocracies. In, in Europe. So Spain in this regard might have also mm, let's say been characterized by a greater pl plurality of aristocracies that altogether were difficult to 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 stem right uh, under uh, in, in, in on the, the base of pre-existing Spanish uh, let's say distribution of wealth and so on. That is not to say that those aristocrats, as we've seen, were not powerful. They had important retinues and so on, but not necessarily these retinues were were created to launch dramatic campaigns of expansion or, or you know, of, or strengthening of, of, of power. We know sometimes even the clashes uh, against the, the Byzantine territory were like uh, continuous raiding. Uh, although there wasn't, there weren't, they were rarely massive. Uh, engagements, or you know, probably if there were any, they, they were somewhat also modest and put together by lots of, of of different actors, and in a situation that didn't probably find much of a pre-existing order to uh, to exploit in that ma in in that big sense, in that big um, wake of a of a pre-existing power. These are all things that should be studied thoroughly also and especially looking at pre Visigothic Spain how what the situation really was and what was the genetic let's say balance at the beginning of the Visigothic uh, kingdom but today we can't uh, address the whole thing um, surely um, the, the, the the general trend seems, at least as far as I've seen in my reads, is that th there was probably an increase of aristocratic power over time, right? The, 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 there is an evidence that, you know, if the Arabs had not arrived, on the long run, Spain probably would have ma managed to to maintain some some important cohesion overall, from an institutional point of view especially. It was favored by many factors, even just penalty the geographical one, but probably the fact also the, the, the lack of specific neighboring threats as we've seen of a specific mm, theater that was evidently the, 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 the territorial horizon of the uh, of the Goths. Uh, the, the, there were also other problems as communities, different communities from the Christian one existed. The Visigoths began to persecute uh, repressively from an increasing point of view the Jews and the slaves. Right, which um, may be viewed as reflecting insecurity, and in fact, the Jews themselves uh, 
given the state in which they, they were. Uh, Spain had an, a very important Jewish population, as historically also afterwards, but you know, eventually supported also the Arab invasion, seemingly, right, uh, against the Visigothic monarchy because of this constant vexation. Um, also, uh, the, the late Visigothic military legislation uh, actually reflects a period of instability, right? It's a bit like in the Longobard Kingdom, right? It, the laws of recruitment were issued to, mostly towards the end of the kingdom where uh, it was being threatened by the Franks. Uh, and naturally it went in parallel with other political and socio-economical changes. But the idea is that if something works, you don't have to, to hurry up to regulate, to enforce, to, to suppress, right? You know, and generally speaking, this is a, a valid indi indicator of political uh, thermometer, right? Uh, on the other hand, some other people say, you know, th this was effectively a, uh, the, the picture of, of a new capacity to enforce those measures, right? Uh, Perez Sanchez sees the decline of the Spanish kingdom in terms of a change from a regular royal arm in the 6th century to one made up of private magnet retinues in the 7th, and I pretty much agree with that. Um, this is evident, right? By, by the 6th century, the Visigothic army, maybe we didn't insist on this too much, but had been somewhat functional. I mean, it's not that, I don't know, the Visigothic army had never existed, never worked, it was just slaves. No, there, there were also free, and there was a, an important participation and so on. This thing declines, mostly not from a military, I mean, first and from a military, but from a political and social point of view, together with the capacity of the monarchy of mobilizing that element. Uh... Some even say that in the 6th century the Visigothic army was of something like a regular force, maybe on the wake of the Roman military legacy, but um, maybe the terms are a bit exaggerated. Uh, surely there was um, also a, a gradual collapse of the, you know, with the sedentarization of the royally appointed officers, many would autonomize would mm, territorialize the, their prerogatives themselves. So this is something that uh, can easily be seen also in in uh, Merovingian Francia with the, the, the gradual weakening of royal power. In turn, think about the major domes of, of palace, but previously also the comites that had been sent there to uh, by Clovis to administrate the newly conquered land, but eventually you know created basically powers on their own. Um, However, the, the the broader picture tells us about the failure of the Zygotic kings to create an independent coercive force to penetrate local society from the above uh, and create a situation where social preeminence was dependent on, upon royal favor. Right? This is an important impact. And in my opinion, the fact that especially the South was excluded by the rule, because you know, if you look at the Arabs, for example, you see that they fundamentally started to rule from the south, and they created an actually a, a centralized state. It was the only one uh, together with the Byzantine Empire in Europe. The fact, perhaps, uh, that the Visigothic center of power was in, in the center of the peninsula, um, in that for a longer time the, the, the south was unstable because of Byzantine presence and um, border warfare, let's say, uh, frontier warfare um, might have taken away uh, an important part of Iberian resources from Visigothic potential. I mean, the Justinian reconquest could be really, should perhaps be really read in this terms, because what were the Byzantines sending an army, an expedition uh, up to, into, into Spain if they, you know, didn't have anything to, to earn from it. Of course, those, as we've seen, were the richest and more advanced areas of the peninsula, and they were kept by the Byzantines for for most of his time, of Visigothic, uh, the existence of the Visigothic kingdom. So that's also another very important aspect to consider, that central Spain was not southern Spain, as it was not northern Spain either. It was a compromise, some, something in between, something that the Visigothic kingdom perhaps really was in a in decisive manner. But this doesn't mean that the kings didn't work hard for achieving that. Um... Also, factionalism surely helped to, you know, to usurpations um, and to the broader 
climate of instability. Uh, consider that those who failed in usurpation usually ended pretty badly, right? Um, the the idea is that there was a fierce competition. Also, the kingdom's resources, for example, patronage and lands, especially those confiscated from the enemies, could be used by the king to pay his followers. So there were things that the, the kings could really do to counter the, the balance. Uh, dynastic insecurity also led to repeated strengthening of the ideological and theological underpinnings of the royal office. That is, I can't have... Um, uh, you know, specific. I, I don't can't have concrete power, so I will mostly invest into the the ideology of it, in the in the of kingship, of the sacrality, and increasing the penal the the penalties, for example, for threatening the king's person, right? But that's also something we know from the history of law. The higher the penalties are, the chances it is the lower the the actual functionment of the law really is. Um. Uh, Deposing the king could be uh, also fatal. Fredegard describes the veritable bloodbath which followed Kittisvin's seizure of the throne in 642. Right. Consequently, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that in Visigothic internal policy the stakes seem to have spiraled. Right. So whether uh, such a spiral was inevitable or reversible, uh, that's a bit too deterministic. We we don't I don't buy it f f from fundamentally, but still there is a context context that cannot be ignored. Um, military expansion uh, that was a, had been historically speaking a, a measure for consolidating territorial power. All we can say that all Roman Germanic kingdoms at this point have problems in uh, in man controlling territory, but also in properly um, putting together a, an army to perform those campaigns of expansion and so on. Uh, this is not to be uh, overlooked from a structural point of view, because in the 6th century, the Visigothic king launched a pretty mm, r impressive uh, set of, of expeditions, especially against the, the fringes of, of, the, of the peninsula from which the, the enemy raids arrived. So as a consequence... Um, you know, lots of sources, resources, manpower, agricultural resources when exploited, right? Uh, that's what you can see even in in, uh, in Gaul, right? There is a moment in which, uh, yeah, there are these great campuses of expansion of consolidation. Then the system begins to shrink, right? The retinues always become smaller. There is a, a difficulty to even put together an army because literally the system has exhausted itself also with the pandemics, with the supposed coldening of the climate, but generally speaking, these these are very uh, these are pre-industrial systems. Uh, they're very very delicate uh, from a, in terms of production, right? It takes a really uh, even just a war to to, to disrupt them uh, at the root. Um, uh, after the final unification of the Iberian Peninsula in 624, the Spanish things could neither reward their followers with conquered loot and land, nor carry out the functions of the world leader king in the old way. Always remember that in, in Germanic political culture, everything depends on whether you are a capable military leader. Otherwise, the concept of kingship does not exist, because the power rests ideally in, in, the, uh, in, in the freeman control. And so, also the councils of Toledo played that role in saying, we are the assembly of the Visigothic freemen. Actually, they weren't. But they still were objectively the the aristocracy that controlled the the world uh, and the Visigothic world, and that could legitimize or delegitimize the king, depending on whatever the situation was. Uh, all the constant raids against the Basques uh, and the naturally also the defense from their own raids. Uh, or quelling aristocratic unrest exhausted local resources, right? So th there was naturally a common interest for the kingdom to stay together, but it was still like um, it was the same system uh, at a relatively few hundreds of kilometers away of the distances that was consuming itself, right? 
problems of raising a royal coercive force is uh, what, as we've seen, was 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 were pretty serious. Uh, this may have contributed to the inexperience of Visigothic armies, especially previous in during the seventh century. I mean, previously uh, uh, to previous to the rapid collapse of, of the kingdom in seven hundred eleven, right? The consider the uh, army of the Arab Caliphate and its Berber subjects were battle-hardened enemies. So that does make a difference. But even in here, I. I honestly don't think that like the, we can't speak really of a structural lack of military effectiveness um, if, who knows the story more or less there is this pretty important sense that there, there was a betrayal from the side of the nobility uh, during the invasion um, and that surely doesn't speak for a, for a cohesion so it's explain, it explains a, a, a major defeat Right, even so sudden, so quick, um, but it doesn't necessarily speak for for the actual quality of the Visigothic army, in my opinion, because uh, we always have to stress ah that guy lost, so it was weak. Mm, not really. I mean, there were realities that were. I mean, all these realities were pretty average in their own kind. Right, it's like when I don't know the the the, the Carolingians conquered the Longobard Kingdom, or, or anybody else for that, for that matter. I mean, it's not because the, the I don't know the, the the Saxons or the or the Avars or the Longobards were I don't know necessarily bad. Uh, they were average. They were even average good for the time, right? They weren't what they had been before at a point. But uh, let's be honest: the exception there, the true exception, was the Carolingian army. It was a hell of an army. It was a professional one. So it's not that the other was bad or weak. It was just that you know that that was a giant, for example. For instance, just on its own, I mean, in terms of sheer size, of you know, a scale from which the, the the military resources were drawn, right? Uh, it was a giant against midgets in a way, but um, it it also right. The military standards are always there, right? Especially from an individual point of view. I mean, we can't think that a, I don't know a Visigothic chieftain by a, you know magnate, let's say better by the by the, the the beginning of the eighth century was a hell of a hell of a uh, literally a, almost of a knight proper like in the sense of uh, the heavy heavily armored tough heavy cavalry man that with all its retinue and a functional way of and it spent his life fighting right on horseback so yeah we we don't see much from this we can't see much but this doesn't mean that necessarily we're talking about um, under average right systems some people even said you know Visigothic armies just fought against the Basques because it was a way of doing it you know when every time every uh, a, a Visigothic king was elected they had to show that to, to be military to prove to be military competent so what do they do they launch a campaign against the Basques right and some say ah oh, well but the Basques were kind of a you know uh, underdeveloped people, you know, they were not like the, the, the you know, the, the, the great armies of the Caliphate, you know, the, so the, the the Visigoths didn't have a, you know, a great military experience. Th that's also not a, a realistic statement, right? Aside from the fact that fighting in in, in northern, in, in the northern Iberian Peninsula is, takes a hell of a, you know, tough, especially logistical system in a way, because those are nightmarish places to fight in. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, it's not that the Basques were primitives with clubs, you know, they they had their own their own aristocracies as well, they had their own military organization, they were tough, right, and they were, you know, hard. Surely, maybe, yeah, I mean, in pitched battles, they, they, there wasn't maybe this great cohesion, this great aptness, this great ha attitude, habitude, uh, say, better to great complex maneuvers is you know the, the same armies were all together you know put together from different actors some of whom were probably not even convinced and would just hope to, to take the place of the to be the ne to become the next kings and betray uh, as a consequence so but I mean uh, we know how warfare goes it's not that you can't say you know there is that specific reason, so now we have to determine what deterministically they have to fail. 
No, it may have been that the Visigoths could have even repelled the Arabs for, for maybe just for a while, but still enough to make an important difference in some way. Uh, there is an example from the Visigothic king Bamba that, having heard that his general Paul, whom he had dispatched to quell an uprising in Septimania, had himself rebelled and been proclaimed king in the east, which is interesting because it tells you even how he he didn't he didn't just march, etc. You know, there was all this uh, problem of of kingship to boast, right? And this is already the the the, the ideological side of the Visigothic dynasty, so the, the the king in the east was right, as if Septimania was who knows what. But you know, that's specifically still within the, the, the mental boundaries of that royal ideology of, of the Visigothic king. So what he does, what, what the king does, is that he launched a campaign against the Basques, right? And Bamba's position at the time on the throne may have been fairly insecure. He had been elected rather than inheriting the throne, and having himself anointed, the Visigothic kings also anointed, were anointed like the Frankish ones, um, it seems that he had launched this Basque campaign to demonstrate his military capacity to those who doubted his ability, right? You were not a man if you had not done the ritual campaign against the Basques, right? And and this is important because, you know, Visigothic Gaul at that point was in uprise. And uh, what does he do? He goes to fight and different people. So this tells how important it was even, after all, showing a, a military concreteness in the Visigothic War. It wasn't just something symbolical. Right, it's just let's see what you can do, and, and so these people were were apt, were used to to command to to to, to think they were fundamentally um, military leaders in their name. And even after the news that Paul of Paul's usurpation reached him, Bamba led his troops on a week's ravaging ba of Basque territory. Right. This is not only removed the possibility of Basque support for the rebels, which is another strategical option to take into consideration, but also it gave his army, so theoretically the political assembly, so theoretically the Visigothic people, right, at least as the royal army wasn't the entire thing, but it was still an important part of it, the chance to see that the king was a war leader, who meant business. Uh, it, it gave them a period to hone their martial skills. Uh, it enabled them to demonstrate their prowess to him. It was a way, a more important moral booster, right? So in the expectation of a political and other rewards. So it was a way of testing the army before sending it in the meat grinder, which is to be appreciated. Uh, there was always the opportunity to loot. I mean... Um, I mean, not that in in the Basque lands there was much to, to ravage, honestly, but uh, the um, the the thing is still enough. You know, you go out for war, surely you loot someone's <laughs> their property, so at least you'll become well, not necessarily richer than before, but the idea is that you you allow the thing to happen. So that that is a way to just to call troops together, by being also part of the problem. To give them the motivation, even just for supporting them. Uh, so I, w I thought to, to conclude with some detail about properly Visigothic warfare, like how they fought, like there is some distinctive aspect of it. So to make the long story short, as we were saying in the very beginning of the video, we will make a video on Germanic tactics. Actually, in part we already did. Uh, it's on the video on the um, the, the chapter the strateg strategicon. Um, about the blonde-haired peoples, right? That is, from the 6th century, it fits, broadly speaking, all the Germanic populations. And uh, these were normal armies in many ways. I mean, uh, cavalry, infantry, and uh, naturally a prevalence of, of infantry, numerically speaking. Perhaps cavalry, we, we don't know how much, but it was already quite important. Uh, and the more, especially towards the 8th century, it had probably remained. Um, as we'll see now, even Archer said, but you know, it was a pretty standard army for Western warfare standards. So the, the, there isn't much to uh, to to add in this sense. But there are certain interesting features we can 
observe here. For example, Christian liturgies came to feature prayers for the victory of the army. Right, such prayers especially hoped for triumph over pagans and barbarians, probably meant. This is fascinating because uh, it shows unequivocally how flexible the concept of barbarian actually was and how the, the, the same Visigoths actually had embraced a part of, of Roman international, uh, you know, phraseology, uh, let's say. And this is... Uh, important because it's a it also speaks for the properly from the imitation Visigothic imitation of the Byzantine Empire through the councils of Toledo through the, this ecumenic power Orthodox Christianity so who are the enemies of uh, of the Visigoths they're still the barbarians because the Visigoths are not barbarians and that's what they think of themselves but they think there are barbarians so there's also another you know very interest, exp, interesting evidence of how everybody is a barbarian to each other. So it's not that calling someone a barbarian is the you know a specific uh, cultural uh, you know uh, remark. Everybody thinks that they're better than others, and that even those who were called barbarians now were proud to say that others were barbarians because they were not anymore. So the the, the propaganda, the anti-Roman propaganda, the thing, ah, oh, you know, those were bastards because they called each other barbarian. C concentrate on other historiographical ideas, <laughs> just you know, as a service to your own intelligence. Um, so, the Visigothic service for the departure of the king and his army included having the army's holy cross standard with reliquary, right, and other banners blessed by the bishops. So here we are in heavily um, Christianized context of in political and military culture. This was very similar also in, in, in Merovingian Frankel, but perhaps, yeah, I mean, in different ways. But the, the Visigothic service um, also for a departing army used the phrase ad ulzionem, so to, to vengeance, which naturally, uh, almost as a uh, a, a, a charge, right, um, that um, actually reflects also in here the, the idea of, of naturally of a righteous war, right? This is not just to, to victory, this is to vengeance. I mean, to the idea that somebody had caused a pretty messed up thing that you have to 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 wash with blood. I mean, the ulcio in, in Latin is a hell of an insult. Uh, it's a hell of an offense, of a sacrilege, almost. Um, so it's something you have to really wash. Um, and uh, so this was the righteous side. This is how the, the mentality was developing, and uh, it had been developing similar ways in terms of military ideology in, in Western Europe. Um, naturally, uh, warfare was mostly about feuds, right? Clanic clashes, and even when the thing was dynastic or even royal in matter, the, there was still this sense this of 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 the German feud of you know, the, the sense of, uh, of pride and honor of, of the mob that you couldn't, they couldn't take a single word uh, more. And it, it's according to the fragmentary chronicle of Saragossa, also that an Ango kills King Amalric of the Visigoths. So the Ango was this weapon, if you remember, that made usually, especially the ones with a straight tip to, to, to pierce through armor, have a very high level of penetration. Uh, archery was important, as I would say, in every uh, uh, let's say in every Romano-Germanic army by law, in the sense that lower strata of the population were issued with a minimal equipment of quiver, and um, I don't remember what shield usually. I mean, some some basic um, equipment as archers, as foot archers, basically. Um, in here, there is all the thing that from the migration era, especially the Germans who fared the the east, east more, so the Goths, generally speaking, especially the Ostrogoths, but also the Visigoths, uh, might have been objectively more influenced by uh, archery in, in, uh, in contact with the steppes or steppes peoples in general. Um, yeah, so it's possible, surely, that the, the Goths, that the Longbirds had broadly speaking, more emphasis on Archer than, say, the Anglo-Saxons or the Franks. Yeah, I mean, totally Pacific. Um, 
it's just they at this point like by the 8th century everybody did right it's, it's not like the, the reminiscence of, of those times surely when the Visigoths settled into uh, Western Europe it, it's possible right it's possible for them because we don't we don't clearly know right yeah I mean we can't even say uh, go as far as saying the Eastern Roman Empire used easily more archery than the Western so altogether they received this influence from many sources and it seems that archery remained important in Western, even if this broader, let's say, aristocratization of warfare and the increased importance of cavalry kind of um, tends not really to decrease the importance of, of missile fire, but uh, to to obscure it historiographically speaking. Because the more you're noble and cool and armored and, and so on, and, and the, least, uh, the, the more, um, you know, uh, cowardly it sounds that you have to fight with missile troopers. That's all a stereotype and thing, a problem that even exists in the Germanic epics, right? It's all a... But exactly because it exists, it actually reveals that archery was there and it was important. Regarding ambushes, too, I mean, we have a few evidence of this. The Visigoths destroyed a Frankish army invading Septimani in 589. A small force of Goths attacked the Franks whilst the latter were having a meal. Um which, I mean, it's not necessarily a matter of ambush, but rather, you know, it, you know the others didn't have much of a discipline or, or reconnaissance. Um, the Duke Desiderius was instead less fortunate during the pursuit of a possibly f faint flight by Visigothic troop, while in the 70s of the 7th century, some of Vamba's Visigothic troops were likewise caught by a sally by Paul's rebel warriors from the amphitheater of Nîmes. Right when they uh, they pursued too far. I don't know if you ever been to Nîmes, but there is this beautiful arena that uh, it, it was an imposing, uh, you know, fortress for for early medieval standards. Of course, of most of Roman infrastructures would be. And uh, just thinking that, you know, that <laughs> you know that were there that those 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 troops were, it, it's punching. Um, uh, relatively to prisoners, the 2,000 prisoners taken by the Visigoths after their triumph over a Frankish army in 589, the one they said before, were eventually released and found their way home. But that's a broader political reason. Also, once you defeat an invasion of that kind, at that distance, like if you if 2,000 Franks leave or die, it's not the problem. It's it's better that you manage to defeat them so you show them not to do it anymore. Uh, otherwise, punishments, uh, it's not that the Visigoths were lenient towards prisoners or, or anything. Uh, in Visigothic Spain, specifically, remember the Ulcio, the, 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 the idea of revenge, taking revenge of the offense. Well, usually defeated parties in those broader political clashes or also with the, 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 the uh, usurpations, etc., could be ma maimed and publicly humiliated in front of the army and the people. The decalbatio that we were saying before uh, was aimed also at that, but there were important physical mutilations as well. Similarly, the Visigothic campaigns against the Byzantine enclave of uh, Spain were concerned with the capture of cities, so we see a bit of um, siege warfare, of course, um, also followed by serious sackings at a time. The Byzantine military doesn't seem to have had the capability to wage open warfare against the gods. I mean, after all, the, the Roman territories in Spain were were small at that time. Um, it's a bit like in Italy. I mean, from the beginning of the 7th century, from from this reconquered lands, they, there is no mobile army stationed there. So it's just militia, and they don't send out set forth for campaign into the... What's the point, right? The enemy owns the wall interland. It's huge, and what the hell are you going to do? Just concentrate on the defense. That's the, what they would do. Uh, the campaign by the Visigothic king Leovigild against his rebellious son Hermenegild was also concerned with a steady reduction of those cities which had declared for the rebel. Spain, also central Spain, as we've seen before, had important cities. 
So these communities were important for the military balance of uh, Roman and Germanic kingdoms, especially in southern Europe, where naturally they were more developed and still alive, usually by the, the, the in, throughout all these centuries. So it was important, naturally, to punish those cities uh, that had supported uh, an enemy. And it was an occasion of plunder just by seizing them, actually, and to reduce the the importance of uh, even of the cities for strategical reasons, because you can't even punish that, but you don't necessarily have the capacity of raising it to the ground, and therefore, you know, politics is volatile, and maybe the, that that city instead will will remain. So uh, it was important to concentrate the action even on those centers. After the reign of Sisebuto between 612 and 620, the Visigoths maintained also a reasonable fleet. There is this often overlooked capac modest capacities of Romano-Germanic kingdoms in Mediterranean, especially to man fleets. And we know that in one engagement in the reign of Vamba, that it was between 673-680, as many as uh, 270 Arab ships are claimed to have been destroyed. Which uh, maybe is a bit exaggerated, but why not? I mean, and uh, but normally Romano-Germanic kingdoms are eminently terrestrial powers, and fleets cost a hell of a money. Of course, they, these um, in the, the the Mediterranean coastal cities have both the infrastructures and manpower, and often wealth to and, and capacities and experience to to build and man ships. Uh, but there's not a tremendous activity in early medieval times either. But it's just that it's also least, it, it, it's not well documented. There are a few sources and we don't quite get the. Uh, going back, a bit back in time, speaking of Adrianople, we have evidence, according to Amianus, that the, um, the, the, the gods used fire hardened, actually, they threw huge fire-hardened clubs at the Romans, right? Then passing to, to the blades. And this broke, uh, this is how the, the left, uh, the Roman left was broken in Adrianople. Uh, and it's believed that since the gods famously on that occasion fought close to their lager, to their camp, they could have stockpiled such clubs and thrown them at the heavily armored Roman infantry, which uh, it, it's what uh, I would say a traumatic weapon like like club is is designed exactly for. That was important because the, naturally the Romans had a, also an equipment some of, of, of an edge at that point over the the gods that weren't faring very well. So that that's just a simple but effective weapon against arm. Uh, throwing clubs was was actually something that went on over time. In fact, uh, Isidore, bishop of Visigoth Seville until 636, commented on uh, a mention of Teutonic clubs from Virgil. And he literally says the club, the, the club, uh, that, that's the Latin term, is Hercules' weapon, so-called because it is held together by our iron nails, the clavis, in fact. It is a foot and a half in length, such is also the Catheia, with Horus, uh, which Horace calls Kaya. It is a Frankish, he, he uses the adjective Gallica, so literally Gallic, because, you know, that's uh, the, alongside the classicistic um, ethnographic uh, separation. And we a weapon made from the hardest wood. When hurled, being heavy, it won't fly far, but will smash with the utmost strength. If, it, um, if thrown by someone, someone skilled, it comes back to him. Kind of a boomerang, right? Thinking of this, Virgil, in 8, in 8 um, uh, 7, 741, says the, uh, of the Abelians, wanted to fling clubs as the Teutons do. This is why the Visigoths, in, uh, in uh, Isidore's prose, the Hispani, right, so the Spanish, and, the, and Franks, the Galli, uh, called them Tautani, uh, because of the Teutons. Since Isidore speaks of the of Teutons, his Hispani seem to be the Visigoths, and his Galli the Merovingian Franks of his own day. Right. And both these nations therefore 
are described thus using clubs as late as the 7th century with smashing effect. There was also a bit of uh, psychological effects, sound effects, sensorial experience. The gods at Adrianople attacked like a thunderclap in the mountains, right? This idea of the Odinic thunderstorm that arrives in battlefield and uh, that is, that, that is the, the same experience of battle and also s simulated by war cries, by shouts, by the barritas and so on. In the Battle of the Willows in the year before uh, 377, Gothic warriors, two sang of ancestral heroes, bring Amianus Marcellinus coughs in quote, in grating voices the praise of their four forebears. This we've seen it recently talking about early Germanic war warfare. It was something very common, right? All these chants before battle that had actually a very deep religious historical meaning for, for the Germans when they fighting. And this is also what in fact Vegetus advises in the fourth century AD. Uh, quote, while doing the war dance, climb onto the enemy's shield and come down again, and now doing the justice, swinging the shield, jump forward and fall back. And in fact, in, in the Battle of Adrianople, uh, the gods fought in, in this way. And, uh, yeah, and, and these are aspects that were shared naturally by other Germanic populations, but mm, it was just, I don't know, an indication of a of a previous time that is the one the the gods entered the Roman Empire and start their their journey in the in the Romanized lands. However, um yeah, I mean that that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Uh we could naturally tell much more about the Visigothic army and Visigothic warfare, but I think this was a was a you know interesting at least look at certain aspects of it to to frame it a, a little bit better and surely we will continue more in detail to discuss this specific uh, realities even the troops typologies the uh, tactics uh, at some point and so on uh, anyhow, for now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.